And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. You know, I'm at a quandary here at Power of Prophecy because I I perceive that there are so few people in the entire world who understand what it is we're dealing against here. I, I mean, we oppose evil, and that's easy to say. We're We love righteousness and goodness and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we oppose all that's opposed to it, which is, well, in a handbasket, evil. Put it all in one place. But I wonder how many how many people really understand the essence of evil. If you really understood the essence of pure evil, my friends, you would not be frightened of it. You would not run away from it. You would not scream and throw up your hands and, and retreat as quick as possible and stay away from it. And No, if you really understood the true meaning of the evil force to which we are opposed, with all of my might, I'm going to, to fight it. I, I'm your ambassador. I'm your representative. I work for God. We're all in this together, but I I want you to understand that when people talk about the devil or Satan, they they make jokes about it, you know, like as if there really were not a devil. You know, opinion polls show that most people believe they're good and as good people, if there is a heaven, and most people, I think about 87% of those polls believe in a heaven, believe they're going to go there. But interestingly enough, only about 14% of Americans and Poles believe in a hell. And few believe they'll be there. Everyone thinks, well, I'm good enough. I, I'll, I'll be in heaven. I'm a good person. No one seems to understand that hell and heaven are not based on how good you are. They're not based on, you know, kind acts or generosity or these are real places the hell and heaven these are real conditions these are things that are going to confront you and I and let me tell you something to achieve to achieve heaven is beyond your grasp you cannot will yourself to heaven You're not strong enough. You're not good enough. You're not kind, generous, loving, merciful. No, none of the righteous, none of those things will will win your way to heaven. You need somebody to help you. You need somebody with power, somebody (laughs) gracious who loves you, who says, I'm going to help that person. I'm going to pull them out of the mire, out of the mud. I'm going to rescue the person who is perishing. You need God. At the same time, if you don't know God, you're going, you're sinking in the morass and the quicksand and, and, and below when, when you go down in the quicksand and it's above your, your mouth and your nostrils and, and then your eyes and you're, you're into it and you're, you realize you're choking on it and, 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 the darkness is so horrible and the creatures there and and you know that you're enveloped by a force, a force that is beyond your comprehension that is so unknowable, so mysterious, 
It is the mystery of iniquity. It has drawn you in, and now you cannot escape. You're, you're, it's beyond your measure if you're already there. But, of course, Christ Jesus reaches to you. You're listening to my voice right now. Oh, my voice isn't the best in the world. It's, I may be getting a little older, and it may be a little cracking, and may not have the same melody or tone, tonal quality that it once had, but at least you're able to perceive what I'm telling you. You're able to understand what I'm telling you. And right now, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. When Jesus went into the synagogue and preached for the first time, and and, and well, he actually, as a young boy, he went in and preached. <laughs> and they were amazed at such a young lad. But I, I'm talking about as a as a grown-up man, and he, he went into the synagogue in, in, in Nazareth, and he preached authoritatively. And he told the people today, this is the day of salvation. Your time has come. I mean, <laughs> think about that. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe your day of salvation has come. This is not a sad day. This is a wonderful day. This is a day to jump and shout and forget all your concerns and say, I'm going on with Jesus. I have seen the sun. <laughs> and then after that, after you've accepted him, or maybe I should say he's accepted you. He he, he put, put down his hand to you first, and you reached up and grabbed it. Maybe you were. Maybe you've been sinking in that quicksand. Maybe that was the last thing you saw, that, that hand reaching out for you, and you grabbed onto it. Well, in any case, evil is so powerful a force that you and I cannot fight it on, on our own. Today, I want to talk to you about evil. I want to talk to you about a God. He's not my God. He's not, I pray, your God. But he's a, a God to, to min, millions of people. And they worship him in many different names. I want to talk to you about the name that he's worshipped in the Judaic religion because basically every religion is molded somewhat, is focused somewhat on the same tentacles of the dragon that I call Judaism. Believe it or not, I have studied for many years, oh, I don't know, 35, 40 years or so, about the New Age movement. And I find that there, there are hundreds, thousands of New Age cults, and there are many false religions in this world, and I've studied them all. And I find that at, at its very core essence, each of these religions is... Well, they're the same. And they all worship a similar God or goddess or deity. In the Judaic religion, you must believe me when I tell you that the Jews, the leaders of the Ju Judaic sect, the rabbis and so forth, and the top laymen, the ones who are leading these people into hell, and all those who follow after them. And believe me, there are only about 18 million Jews in the world, but there are billions that believe in the same kind of thing they do. The Hindu, the Buddhist, they too. They could easily convert a Hindu or a Buddhist to Judaism in fact, I understand that one of the prime ministers of great of uh, of Israel, Menachem Begin, was a Buddhist, but he kept it secret. It's Buddhic, uh, Buddhic, Buddhic practices of you know meditation and so forth. He's a Buddhist and uh, was prime minister of Israel. He obviously didn't see much difference. And today, even the Pope of Rome could easily convert. Maybe he already has. To Judaism, I mean, the, the Pope for the last twenty years has had Jewish rabbis come to the Vatican and to other centers of uh, where the College of Cardinals and the others are and teach them. Even though the Bible says 
that the rabbi has nothing, nothing to offer a Christian. In fact, he brings you a package, a mysterious package. He opens it up for you, and you will find in there evil, an evil force. Because the natural man, and he is a natural man, the natural person is the one who has not received Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the natural man does not receive the things of God. He, can, he cannot understand them. I remember many years ago I was visiting the office of J.R. Church. He's passed away now. Prophecy in the News in Oklahoma City. He says, Tex, when do you think the Messiah is coming? Jesus. When do you think he's coming again? And I said, well, I don't know. But certainly the signs of the times are here, aren't they, J.R.? He's, oh, yes, they are. He says, well, I believe I know when he's coming. I, I believe it's going to be, and he named some year, like three or four years distant. I said, really? How do you know that? He says, well, I was talking with this rabbi friend of mine here in Oklahoma City. We went to dinner together, and I asked him that question, and he told me, you know, A, B, C, D, E. And he, he, he wanted to continue with his discussion. He thought this was so scholarly and so academic and that I would just be fascinated with, with him learning what the rabbi, who he assured me was a student of Kabbalah, knew about the coming of Messiah. And I cut him off instantly. And I said, what does that rabbi know? He said, well, he studied for many years at this seminary. And he's, he's, uh, he's been recognized by the, uh, the such and such a school of rabbis. And he's, I said, wait just a minute, J.R. This man has nothing of value to give you and me. Well, I mean, it's, it may be of interest a little bit, but I'd rather know what you as a Christian have to say about Jesus coming than this man. This man is is a devil. Oh, how can you say that he's a rabbi? I said, don't Jesus himself said, call no man rabbi. Don't even call the guy a rabbi. He's a natural man. He does not receive the things of God. He cannot know. In fact, only God knows when Jesus is coming again. And for goodness sake, no rabbi would ever, ever know. No, I don't even ask him the question. Don't even pay attention to these monsters. Oh, oh, you don't believe in the Kabbalah? I said, are you, are you, you're kidding me, J.R. No, I, I didn't know J.R. that well. I got to know him. and He was deep into this Jewish stuff, all this Jewish religion, and he, he, he put, Christianity into the package. He mixed up Christianity and, 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 and Judaism, and he would have articles in his magazines talking about you can tell the future from the stars and all that kind of astrology and those kind of things. Now, I want to introduce you. I, I know you don't want to meet him. I know you don't really want this introduction, but I'm going to introduce you to the God of the Jews. You see, if you've read the Old Testament, you, you think you know the God, but they use the Talmud and the Kabbalah, two other sets of books, to define God, to explain God. You, you know how they reinterpret things. I, I mean, you may think something is very plain spoken, but they have interpretations and they have entire, I mean, they have entire books to talk about one little bitty facet of God. Now, you're going to learn about a God of the, of the Jews today that they won't tell you about. In fact, it is against the law, the Judaic law, punishable by death for you to be taught these things. So if you believe in the, the Jewish religion, if you believe that their restriction against you stands, then better you better go somewhere else because you're going to find out the name of the, the God that they really worship, his real name. And then you're going to be liable to them. Their Talmud says that this is an offense punishable by death for a Jew to teach a Gentile of, of, of the true meaning of the Talmud. 
And certainly you're not able to go to the Kabbalah. But if you really want to know, the Bible says nothing is to be kept secret from the saints. Jesus said, <laughs> someday those things that they whisper about, he's going to shout it from the housetops. So I'm just doing a little shouting today. Maybe you'd like to, to, to take advantage of this. Maybe you'd like to know. Maybe you say to blazes <laughs> with the Talmud, I want to know what God's word says. I want to know the truth. Well, then you're going to get that today. Now, Harold Rosenthal, in a little book, he was interviewed back in 1976. The book is called The Hidden Tyranny. He was the congressional staff assistant, the, the chief uh, uh, executive of the office of uh, a well-known uh, Jewish uh, U.S. senator, Jacob Javits, Harold Rosenthal. And he admitted <laughs> he was flat out. <laughs> he, he, he was a Jew who, you know, admitted that the Jews were God's chosen and were superior and all those things. But he said, we have a, he said, we Jews who have studied this have a more precise grip on who God is. You know, he was asked the question, who is the, the God of the Jews? He says, quote, most Jews do not like to admit it, but our God is Lucifer. We are his chosen people. Lucifer is very much alive. How can that be? Can Lucifer truly be the God of the Jews? Well, the Kabbalah will tell you. Now, Leo Shaya is a, a Jew. He's author of The Universal Meaning of the Kabbalah. Very authoritative book, reference book, written back in 1971. He explains all about the Kabbalah and its true meaning. And according to the Kabbalah, hell, now get this, folks, hell is the bright hope of the wicked. <laughs> if you're wicked, there's a bright hope. It's not Jesus. You see, the wicked, and, and every, every Jew needs to be wicked for a certain period of time. Because only through wickedness can you learn about the good. And you must combine both evil and good, black and white, the, the, the Masonic checkers on their floors, so to speak, to, 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 to travel the path of enlightenment. And of course, you need a, a very wise Jewish rabbi or sage to take you along that route. And, and the books of the Kabbalah, Mr. Ashaya said, and by the way, you spell that name S-C-H-A-Y-A, -A, if you want to look up that book, The Universal Meaning of the Kabbalah. The books of the Kabbalah, he says, are they contain esoteric, hidden wisdom. He says, this is the reception of pure wisdom. Intended, says Mr. Sharia, for the spiritual elect of Israel. These are the mysteries hidden since the beginning of time. So this is the bait for the curious person intrigued by the mystery teachings. You, you wish to delve into the hidden knowledge. Mr. Shaya explains it all to you in his the book, The Universal Meaning of the Kabbalah. This is the promise of divine knowledge, superior wisdom. Ah, yes. Judaism, you see, goes back to Babylon. It does not go back to Adam and Eve and the, 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 the uh, books of Genesis on, on up and all the way through the prophets. And... Judaism has its Babylonian roots. It's part of the ancient Babylonian mystery system. And Leo Shaya in the Universal Meaning of the Kabbalah says that the, the Jews learned of these mystery teachings when they were taken captive by Babylon for 70 years. Remember in the book of Jeremiah, it is prophesied that they would be taken captive. 
by the Babylonians, by Nebuchadnezzar and so forth for some 70 years. And when they went to Babylon, as they were brought in as slaves, kidnapped and brought in as slaves, as they passed through the gates of the city, they looked, and what did they see? The image of the dragon, of the dragon serpent indeed, was painted on the walls of the city and was vis- it was visible to all who entered its main gate. That was the main attraction you saw. You're going into the city of the dragon, Babylon. And Shaya says that the wisdom of the Kabbalah went with the people, the Jews, when they returned to Israel. Mm. They were set free by Cyprus, uh, Cyrus, the Persian conqueror of Babylon, and the rabbis and the people returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the destroyed temple. You can read about that in Nehemiah and the Bible. They brought with them the Babylonian doctrine. That is why the the Talmud of the Jews, which is their 813 holy laws, and every rabbi of any stature at all studies this for almost all their lives. The Talmud is the most important book, uh, holy book of the rabbis. It is highly beloved in Orthodox Judaism. Phariseeism was based on it. And today, when you go ask for the Talmud at your library, if they have a copy of it, they probably won't. But if it's a large enough library, they might. Or I suppose you could claim you're a Jew and go down and borrow a copy from <laughs> your local rabbi. Or if you've got a couple hundred bucks, you can go on Amazon and buy Amazon and buy a software edition of the Talmud. And Jesus said, these are the traditions of the of the rabbis. This is the traditions of man. That's their religion. Do you remember when Jesus said that? They didn't say we, our religion is Judaism. Their religion was Phariseeism. And the Talmud today is, is formally titled the Babylonian Talmud. <laughs> the Jews today call their Talmud the Babylonian Talmud. It comes from Babylon. That's the great secret of Judaism. Their religion comes from Babylon, as do all of the false religions of the world, as does Freemasonry. The concepts. Albert Pike, the sovereign grand commander of Freemasonry in the 19th century, in his book Morals and Dogma, the classic textbook of Freemasonry, even today says our 33 rituals originated from the Kabbalah, the Jewish Kabbalah. But where did the Jewish Kabbalah originate? From Babylon, from the wisdom teachings of the serpent. The mystery of the serpent is the royal secret of the Babylonian Talmud. That's why Jesus told the Jews, ye serpents. He called them serpents. Ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, verse 33. Wouldn't you, wouldn't, if Jesus called me that, I would just melt. I mean, I've stood up to a lot of evil people. I've, I've debated New Agers and Satanists and all kinds of, of evil people on TV and radio stations across America. And I haven't shrank one bit. They, 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 they emboldened me. I became more and more uh, bold in debating them. But if Jesus Christ had simply uttered these words to me, I I would have died. I would have shrunk. I would have been defeated. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? But they didn't shrink. No, they got angry with him. And they went on, of course, to crucify and murder him. Now, the Kabbalah is pure Illuminism. You heard about the Illuminati? This is what the Illuminati believe. This is what they're instructed in. It has many facets, many different religions and cults and and, and mystery teaching groups. And, of course, the twisted and perverted secret doctrine of all that Helena Blavatsky, in her book, The Secret Doctrine, 
tells the people is that eventually in studying Kabbalah, you will embrace, that is if you accept these teachings, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, that the Holy Serpent is the true God. You will discover that all the evil that a person does through alchemy, through their lives, is magically transformed into righteousness. And that, yes, Lucifer is Lord. Harold Rosenthal understood it right. He's, most Jews don't know it, but Lucifer is our Lord, and he's alive. And that's what I'm trying to tell you today, folks. I'm trying to say Lucifer is alive. This is a, a God, an evil, ferocious, mysterious God to some who seeks to destroy us. The Bible says he roars like a lion and he, and he roars back and forth. This whole earth looking for who he can destroy and devour. And my friends, because you have accepted Jesus... He, he has targeted you. Why do you sometimes have some hard times in your life? It's because of Satan, what, what he's trying to do to you. But Jesus will lift you out of that. This for the Satanist, and I, I put the New Age movement and all the various cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, everything, all these people, Mormons, all that, in the same basket of evil. They all have Satan or Lucifer or the serpent. It's all the same as their true and only God. That's the essential doctrine of Kabbalism. That is the horror. That is the shame of the Kabbalah. Let me read to you what a few friends of mine have to say about the Kabbalah. They know about it. John Terrell, publisher of The Dove, a Christian newspaper. Terrell's a good friend of mine, a pastor from California. He says the Kabbalah contains power of demonic teaching. It is more than enough to keep the ideology and driving force needed to lead the world astray and to keep such an evil conspiracy alive through the centuries. The Kabbalah is a teaching source of the Freemasons as well as for other groups. That's why the conspiracy has stayed alive throughout the centuries. I mean, I can, I can show you where Christopher Columbus was part of this conspiracy. Craig Heimbeckner in his book, Blood on the Altar, says, Kabbalah is the sacred books of black magic of Orthodox Judaism, which form a large part of the basis of the Western secret societies. He mentions Freemasonry in the OTO. He says, Kabbalism is itself derived from the sorcery of ancient Babylon and Pharaohic Egypt. Oh, oh the, the magicians, the court magicians the uh, of the Pharaoh. Remember when Moses came in and they had their serpents? And they would use these serpents for divination and magic. James Lloyd, the man I respect, author of the Apocalypse Chronicles and other great publications, says the Hebrew Kabbalah is a series of occultic writings that are as demonic as any incantation ever uttered in witchcraft. Webster's Dictionary, writes Lloyd, tells us that the Kabbalah is an occult religious philosophy developed by certain Jewish rabbis, end quote. An occult religious philosophy developed by certain J Jewish rabbis. But I've showed you today where they got it, where they got it from. Rabbi... Jeffrey Dennis, in his book, Jewish Myth, Magic, and Mysticism, 2007, Rabbi Jeffrey Dennis talks about the religion of Judaism and the Kabbalah. We'll, we'll look at what Rabbi Dennis has to say about the Kabbalah, and, and I'm, I'm going to introduce you, by the way, to the, 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 the hidden name of Lucifer and Satan, and you, you're going to find out the hidden name of the Jewish high god. When we return, I'll be right back. I'm Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. Hello, friends. Tex Mars here. You know, we've published a great book. I mean, this is one of the greatest books that I've read in my lifetime. 
It's by Martin Luther, the great reformer. You know, in the 1500s, God produced Martin Luther. He was a German man, and he saw that the Catholic Church had become very corrupted, and he believed very strongly in his conscience that God could be reached by prayer, by reaching out to him, that the individual did not need to go to priest or cardinal or pope or bishop, although those were fine entities, but that he could go directly to God. You could talk directly to God and God would listen to you because you're one of his saints, if you are one of his saints. <laughs> and he was also against the, the payment of money or gifts to the church that would then light a candle or you know pray or do something to help one of your loved ones who'd already died to escape a few years of purgatory. You could get your sins forgiven by paying money. Of course, if you were a poor person and didn't have any money to pay, well, you're just going to have to suffer the, the hell pangs of purgatory, and, you know, that's the way it goes. But the rich could sort of get out of jail, so to speak. Uh, Martin Luther was tried for these horrible crimes of believing in Jesus first and the Pope second, I guess you could say, or last. Even the Holy Emperor of, of, of Europe put him on trial. The Pope then excommunicated him, sought to take his life. That he was protected by God, and today we have the Lutheran Church. That's you know, comes from his name. But Martin Luther wrote many books. In fact, he wrote a hymn book, some of the most beautiful hymns. We, they're still sung today throughout the churches. Of course, today we're getting this crummy fake music in the churches, but A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That was a, a hymn by Martin Luther. He even wrote a Bible. And amazingly, it, it, probably 1% of it is different than the King James. And that's only in certain little bitty words and such in the Luther Bible. A great man of God, but in his early life, he wanted to be friend of the Jews. You see, Martin Luther was a kind and merciful man. He was really the working man's pastor because he believed that the common person was very important to God. You didn't need to be a pope and dress up in all these fancy uh, gowns and robes and uh, wear uh, all these regal colors and you know, put a crown on your head and live in a sumptuous mansion to be recognized by God. No, even the lowliest creature <laughs> was beloved by Jesus Christ, said Luther. But he became the most famous author in the world. He wrote many books. He died, I believe it was 1546, three years before he died, just three years before he died at the age of 62, Martin Luther wrote a book. That book has been banned and censored throughout the world for the last almost 500 years. And we're bringing it back in English. So you, can, you and I can understand it easily. The words of Martin Luther. What does he say about the Jews? Now, Martin Luther loved the Jews. He invited rabbis into his home as a young man. He would have, uh, he would, you know, give them, you know, sweets or feed them or whatever, and 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 then they would have discussions. They would have, you know, religious discussions and. It was his opinion that he later realized was wrong that the Catholics did not, you know, they were not kind to the Jews. If only we Christians would be kind to the Jews and invite them into our homes as friends, we could save some of them. And that was deep in Martin's heart. He wanted to help save the Jews. He wanted to tell them about Jesus Christ, their Messiah and our Messiah. He, he did not want anyone to go to hell, and he wrote, actually wrote a book 
He says Jesus was a Jew. That was the name of the book. On Jesus being a Jew, I think was the formal title of it. And he would tell the rabbis and the others, the other Jews, Jesus was a Jew too. He said, let us as Christians be kind to the Jews. When, when they're sick, let's send our doctors and our nurses to them. Let, let's take them into our homes with, if they're poor. Let's help them out. Now, he noted that not many Jews were poor. They were very wealthy Jews. He noted they were among the most wealthy of the people, but of those who were poor, he, he reached out to. But then after Martin Luther became one of the most famous men in Europe, after he had written the book Befriending the Jews, he had a man visit him who was a Jew, but had become a Christian. And this man told Luther, uh, Martin, you have made a terrible mistake. You have written that we should reach out and love the Jews, but the Jews do not love us. I am a Jew. I know. Each week in their synagogue, they curse us. They actually have an oath that they take every year called a cold need drape to spite us with their lips in their synagogues. They put curses, horrible curses on us. They spit on us. They laugh, they mock, and they say horrible things about our Lord Jesus Christ and his, even his mother, horrible, terrible things. They teach lies and they destroy men's souls and Judaism is a horrible religion. And, of course, Luther was just shocked and amazed. How could this be? These people who he had befriended all these years were evil. They had they, they, they secretly, behind his back, after he was friends with them, would go and laugh and mock Jesus Christ. How could that be? He had never known such a, a people. And Martin Luther decided, determined that he would study the Jews' books. He would get the Talmud and read it, even the Kabbalah. And when he did, he was, he was hurt in his heart. He was shocked but also shamed at these books because he realized that Judaism was a terrible, horrible religion. It was the most satanic he had ever come upon. And all of the kindnesses he had shown the Jews, he knew were reversed on him. They hated the Gentiles. Their Talmud even says, when we gain our power, when we receive the whole world, the Jews will be, the, the Gentiles will be our servants. And we will kill all who do not become our servants. The Gentiles are nothing but animals. They're beasts, they're goyim. We, the Jews, are superior. We are even superior to God. He, he, he saw in their book how they had twisted and misinterpreted and reinterpreted and uh, the horrible things they had done to Scripture. They changed uh, the Old Testament even so that the words had no meaning at all. They did. And he realized, he said, I must tell the people about the dangers of Judaism. This is a horrible, satanic, a cancer growing within our own society, within the communities of Germany and Europe. And, and these people are powerful and rich, and they, they have this satanic doctrine. And the people don't even know about it because no one has told him, and he determined that he would write a book. And this is that book, Own the Jews and Their Lies. Now, he doesn't talk necessarily about the character of the Jews, but what they have taught and what they believe about our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a book that defends Jesus. It takes up for Jesus. And friends, this book is banned. It's banned in the United States. You can't find it at bookstores. You can't find it anywhere except through Power of Prophecy. I think they have like a 30-page booklet that takes some of the parts out and publishes those. And they, they call it the Jews and their lies. But this is the classic book. This is Martin Luther's exact book, around 230, 240 pages. 
We put a nice cover on it. I wrote the foreword for it. I studied this book. I've read it over and over, and it, every time I read it, it has more and more meaning to me to see how the Jews have taken the Scriptures and turned them around and falsified the Scriptures and said horrible things about Jesus and his mother. I, I mean, they crucified Jesus, but why do they... After so many centuries, why do the Pharisees, the Orthodox Jews, why do they still say terrible things? Why do they preach lies about our Savior? That's what bothered Martin Luther so much. And he has things he said we we should do. We should not allow them to teach these things. We should not allow them to live among us and to preach such heresies and horrors. Now, this is a man who lived almost the time of Christopher Columbus. I believe he was nine years old. Martin Luther was nine years old when Christopher Columbus discovered America. They didn't have other religions, but Christianity allowed the Jews, allowed them to preach their religion, allowed synagogues, and allowed the Jews to live peacefully among them and to make money through usury, through banking from them. And they had garnered many riches. Now, the, the Muslims, the, he call, uh, Martin Luther calls them the Turks, <laughs> the Muslims had been defeated. They were nowhere around in Europe at that time, but, oh, yes, the, the Jews were everywhere doing their dirty work in secret. And this is what Martin Luther determined that he would expose, and he did. Now, we have this book right now. It just came out. Martin Luther owned the Jews and their lies for $20. Please add $5 for shipping and handling, and we will send it to you. Remember, you can't get this book anywhere. This is the book that's been banned by the Pope and the Catholic Church and by the Jews. Can you imagine these two forces banning this book, censoring this book? Any publisher in America that would publish this book would be horribly punished. Now, some would say, well, aren't you going to be punished, Tex? Well, I don't care. <laughs> I've already told you. I'm only afraid of Jesus Christ. That's, that's, <laughs> that's all. And he hasn't done any harm to me at all. He's only done good to me my entire life. And he's the only one I fear. So <laughs> that, <laughs> that solves that problem right away. I publish the books he wants me to publish. I offer them to you. You will be blessed by this book. It will tell you the truth of Jesus in, in, in a magnificent way while exposing the Jews. Now, I, I first heard about Martin Luther being an anti-Semite. I think it was, oh, about the fifth year of my ministry, I was invited to this place, and this pastor got up and spoke and said that Martin Luther, I don't read Martin Luther anymore, He's a, he was an anti-Semite, a Jew hater. I thought, wow, Martin Luther is one of the heroes of the faith. He's one of the great pioneers I mean, what kind of anti C? So I, 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 I went up to the pastor afterwards. I said, now, what, 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 what have you read about Martin Luther that he's an anti C? I'd like to know about that. Well, I haven't read anything, but I understood he wrote a, a book about the Jews. Oh, what was the name of that book? I want to read it. Well, I haven't read it, he said. I just heard about it. Now, I ask everywhere. I ask pastors. I, I, I <laughs> Have you read the book by Martin Luther? Well, no, we haven't read it, but he, we, we, are, we hear he's an anti-Semite. Really? An anti-Semite? Um, well, I want to know about it. Folks, this man has been called an anti-Semite for almost 500 years. He wrote this book three years before he died. And his very last sermon, the last... <sighs> the last sermon that he gave from the pulpit he warned the people and their leaders about the Jews. His final sermon, after defeating the Catholic Church, after leading a quarter of a billion now of the, the, their Protestants in the world toward true salvation, he took on the Jews. What a man. <laughs> Boy, he took on the two greatest foes in the history of Christianity. And he defeated them with his words. These words, these words that you will find in this book. Get this book. See if what I'm saying is not so. 
Martin Luther on the Jews and their lies for 20 bucks. They had five dollars shipping ahead and a total of $25. You can buy it from Power of Prophecy. Just phone us here during the week. And our very friendly telephone person, man or woman, will talk to you and take down your offer. All you have to do is phone us toll free, 1-800-234-9673. And, uh, and we'd be glad to do so. Or you can just send us $25, check money order or cash. Just send it to Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Or you can go to our website, powerofprophecy.com, powerofprophecy.com, or you can type in texmars.com. You go take it to the same place, and there you'll see the book. It's right on our home page. And you can order it with your PayPal or your charge card right online. By the way, the book will eventually be, be offered on uh, uh, amazon.com. I, I hope it will. Eventually, you know, <laughs> I think they, they're probably going to fight it. I mean, there's some reason why it's never been offered before. I think they have a little book called Martin Luther, uh, The Jews and Their Lies, it's, but it's only 30, 40 pages, something like that. It's a little booklet. You need the the new book, the 2014 edition with Tex Mars being <laughs> uh, writing the foreword. Martin Luther, On the Jews and Their Lies, a great book. I recommend it. Now let's return. To our regular program, we're talking about the true name of the Jewish God. I've said it's Lucifer. I've said it's Satan. It came from ancient Babylon, even before Babylon, I mean, from the beginning of time. The Jews call the name of their God Ein Sof. That's a name I bet you haven't heard about. Ein Sof. E I N, sometimes it's spelled A Y N, Sof. Two words. E-I-N, then S-O-F. Now, you don't read about Ein Sof in the Old Testament, but you will in the Kabbalah. And all the rabbis know about their God, Ein Sof, but they don't know very much. You see, in Judaism, in the Kabbalah, the Zohar, which is one of the books of Kabbalah, explains who Ein Sof is. But it says that Ein Sof is actually the God above all gods. And there are at least 10 gods under him. They're like manifestations, aspects of God. There's Keter, Chokma, Bina, Chesud, Gabura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yisad, Malkut, or Malkut. I think I pronounced about half of those, mispronounced half of them, but that's okay. I don't really care about them anyway. About <laughs> So whatever way I say, I really don't, doesn't matter to me. But I read about all these 10 gods. They're on the, the, the Jewish tree of life. The tree of life. Now, I, I've talked about these gods. And Malkut, of course, number 10, is a feminine god. She's the Shekinah. You've heard about the Shekinah glory? Yeah, that's it. It's the feminine aspect of God. There's all the also the take the kids out of the room as I'm tell you this, but there's a a god named uh, well I won't talk about that, but it's the penis god, the, the the phallic symbol of God. That's why the Egyptians would worship the great well <laughs> like the Washington Monument. Uh, <laughs> there there's a a, a great uh, obelisk in front of the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. I've been there to see that huge uh, obelisk. Of course, you go to Egypt, you'll see the obelisk. But go to Washington, D.C., and you'll see it, and it's uh, 555 uh, feet high, and, which, goes, of course, comes out to 666. But everything in, in Judaism relates back to the ancient Egyptian Babylonian aspects, and everything in Judaism is coded numerically, in an evil way. For, for example, uh, uh, they're all, they're, 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 they're uh, star god. They're star that they represent on their flag. You ever wonder what that six-pointed star is all about? Well, I got a letter from a person. Of course, maybe they read my book, Conspiracy of the Six-Pointed Star, because I explain it exactly. And, and this person writes to me in Adana, and she says, 
It's interesting, says Donna, that the star of Amos 5, yes, it's talked about in the Bible, the star of David, so to speak, the six-pointed star of the Jews, it's in Amos 5, is one that's on the Israeli flag. She said it has six points, six triangles, and six lines. That's six lines in the hexagon, which is contained. Oh, yes, it has a hexagon. You put a hex on people with it. The witches use it. It's right in the very middle of the Jewish star of David. Six points, six triangles, six lines in the hexagon, which denotes 666. By the way, you don't need to go see the Jewish uh, or the Israeli flag. You can go to your dollar bill. Just take it out of your billfold right now and look at it. You have the great seal, don't you? <laughs> it's over the great seal. It's it's our superior God, too. Who put it there? The, the, the 666, it's on your dollar. Well, I think it's very appropriate. It should be on our currency, on our money. Now, the all-seeing eye also is on our dollar bill. The all-seeing eye. You see, the God of Judaism, Ein Sof, closes his eye. He has a closed eye. H have you noticed in, in the, 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 the world of the movies now, in, in the world of entertainment from whether it's, uh, uh, who's the, the black girl, I forget her name now, that's, you know, a uh, famous one. Every time she comes on TV, I'm flipping channels, I flip again. No, not Whoopi Goldberg. Jerry's over there saying Whoopi Goldberg. No, no, no. Beyonce, Beyonce. Of course, she she has that. And, and of course, uh, the, the other one, uh, Madonna, she did the eye. And Beyonce hides an eye. And they all put a hand over their eye and take uh, formal pictures. Uh, the, the other girl, the blonde, uh, the one, the crazy one, that does all the fancy uniforms and costumes and uh, – Gaga, Lady Gaga, I think her name is. Yeah, she has the eye. All of these people have the eye that's closed. That's not the all-seeing eye. That's the God over the all-seeing eye God. That's Ein Sof. That's who they represent. They represent the God over all the gods. That's Lucifer. You, you say, I don't know what they're doing when they put their hand over the eye. I don't know what. The, that's the, the lidless. That's the, the God that closes the eye. But when it does open it, it becomes the all-seeing eye over the pyramid that you find on your $1 bill. Now, Ein Sof is a God that you really need to become acquainted with. Now, according to Rabbi Gershom Skolem, one of the most famous rabbis of all time, the Ein Sof is the God that's over all of the ten lesser deities of the Tree of Life that is worshipped in Judaism. He's the emanator of these ten sephirah, or the ten sephiras, the very name sapphire, the jewel that comes from that. They are energy emanations. Energy emanations. And the God himself, he cannot be seen. He cannot be known. He is mysterious. No one has ever seen this God. He, his name cannot even be pronounced. Ein Sof is a substitute for it. And he is known as the one who closes the eye, but when it opens, then a little bit of light can be seen. He is all darkness. He is all mystery. He's called the nameless being in the Zohar of the Kabbalah. The term Ein means non-existent. He doesn't exist, not to Gentiles. He's greater. God, this God so transcends our human understanding that he's practically non-existent, non-existent. Jewish mystical thinkers can think of this God and understand him a little bit, but not much. Even they say he's nothingness. He's the nothing God. And any, uh, according to uh, Rabbi Judah Hyatt, he says, any name of God which is found in the Bible cannot be applied to the deity. <laughs> any name of God in the Bible cannot be applied to this deity. He's greater than that. He came in the creation, and he may be called by one of these other ten names. In fact, one of them is called the crown. Ketar, K-E-T-E-R. 
If you worship him as Yahweh, that's a substitute, but that's not really God. No, this is a name of God that cannot be found in the Old Testament because the Jews do not worship the God of the Old Testament. My friends, listen to me. When you don't worship the God of the Bible, who is Jesus Christ, the name above every name, read what the Bible says about that. Jesus Christ, the name above every other name, and every knee shall bow before that name someday. If you don't believe in the true God, you're going to believe in the nothing God. That's why they believe in this. They believe in nothing. And when you have a nothing God, he cannot tell you to do anything. He has no guidelines, no strictures. You can be as evil and hellish as you wish, and you are going to go to hell. Why? Because your God has no guidelines for you, no rules. He's a nothing God. He is a nameless being. Many people have written to me about Ayn Rand. They said, where did Ayn Rand get her name from? Her name really is not Ayn Rand. She's a Jew. But I know where Ayn means. It means I. It, it means the eye that's closed, the nameless God, the, the, the mysterious and effable God above all gods. It's a dark God. The serpent represents it. The star represents it, the six-pointed star. And the book of Amos says that the ancient Israelites sacrificed their children to this God. In one of his ten emanations, Malkut or Moloch. They worshiped Moloch. Stephen, the first martyr of Christianity in the book of Acts, he preached to the Jews. They said to him, how dare you bring this Jesus to us? How dare you? He said, let me tell you who, who you Jews, we Jews, you know, he used to be a Jew himself. Now, He's an Israelite, a true Israelite with no guile. He's a Christian. He says to them, let me tell you about your God. Your God is the one you brought from Egypt. You worship him as the star, Kiun or Rimphon. You went whoring after this God. And now you have killed a just one, Jesus Christ. Well, they didn't tolerate that. The Jews were so angry, they... They, they grabbed him and they, they took him and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They ate him alive. And then they took out what was left outside the city and threw his body there and they stoned him to death. Can you imagine being gnashed at? They eat at you with their teeth and take, what do they take bitefuls? The horror of it. You learned about Ayn Sof, and by the way, Ayn Rand, that's where she got the name Ayn. She named herself the nameless God, the unknowable one. There you have it. His real name, of course, is Lucifer or Satan. The ancients called him Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. And there you have it, friends. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is that way of rescue. Einsoff is the way to pure evil. But there is an eye that's open. And there is a hand that's reaching out to you. He will rescue you. And then you'll have nothing to fear. Nothing at all to fear. When the one who it has a name. He has a name. <laughs> He's not nameless. He's not nothing God. His name is Jesus Christ. My friends, my prayer is that you'll each week tune in and discover the power of prophecy.